Should Christians involve themselves in Halloween? It's a good question, isn't it? I'm sure just about any local church out there that stands on the authority of the Bible would say, we gotta avoid the pagan practices. We need to avoid that stuff. I've had some people say, maybe we can just avoid Halloween altogether. You know, it's tough to do. You know, I've got some kids and we can't even go to a grocery shop without seeing a whole aisle on Halloween. It's tough to avoid it, isn't it? In fact, at a local grocery store, they pass out stickers to my kids that have a witch on it. There they are promoting paganism right there to your kids. Today, we're gonna to talk about Halloween, paganism, and the Bible. And uh, that's quite an interesting topic, uh, particularly for Christians. Uh, you know, uh, we're right around this Halloween season. And so a lot of people ask this question. They say, well, what's going on with Halloween? You know, how should Christians view this? And so that's why I put this talk together. We wanted to look at Halloween, take a look at it from a biblical viewpoint, try to get a better understanding of it and see what's going on uh, with that particular festival. Now, you'll notice in the title, paganism. There's a big connection between Halloween and paganism. And so uh, there's a significant portion of this talk where we end up talking about paganism and those sorts of aspects. We're gonna do it from a hopefully God-honoring uh, perspective, taking a look at this, uh, uh, this ancient religion. Well, I also noticed we have some kids out in the audience. Now, this talk is primarily geared toward the adults. It's uh, uh, geared toward your upper uh, uh, high school levels uh, probably as well. Although, if there are kids in here, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. I just want to tell you right up front, uh, we are going to be talking about some of this paganism, some of the sacrifice, and some of the stuff that they've been doing, but they should be able uh, to sit through this without uh, a big issue. The last thing I want to tell you right up the front is I'm going to do some little bit of a connection between paganism and evolution and how those relate. A lot of people don't realize the connections between an evolutionary worldview and paganism in our culture. But you'll probably look at my first uh, slide as I pop it up here. Halloween paganism in the Bible. And you notice uh, everything's orange. Have you guys ever thought about that? Why is orange the color of Halloween? Um, I actually looked this up and did a little research on it. And believe it or not, the ultimate reason is because of a pumpkin. You know, when it comes to modern day Halloween, who is it that loves it? You know who loves Halloween? The stores. The stores love it, don't they? Do you realize when it comes to uh, Halloween and, and what all is going around uh, on the Halloween season, it numbers up to about $11 billion in sales. Uh, this was just for last year. It wouldn't surprise me if the numbers exceed that this year, perhaps even in some subsequent years. But what that comes out to, this is just in the United States, mind you. So uh, that comes out to about $125 per household on things like costumes, trick-or-treating candy, decorations. Many of these things are quite questionable, actually, from a Christian viewpoint. But uh, stores absolutely love it. You know who hates it? Insurance companies. <laughs> Insurance companies do not like it. A lot of things happen on Halloween. It really does. Uh, you know, if you think of uh, arson, there's a number of uh, uh, acts of arson that happen and occur on Halloween, particularly in Detroit. That's one of the areas that's well known for it. Uh, there's other aspects and other dangers to Halloween. For example, pins, poison, and things like that that appear in candy. You know, I grew up uh, in western part of Illinois, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Myself and some friends, we all went trick-or-treating when I was a kid. You know, we used to think it was just some innocent fun. We never thought much about it. I hadn't been taught much about that. And uh, one year, uh, we got some candy. My dad was looking through it. I, w I never understood why my dad would look through it, but he looked through it, and he found a pin in one of my pieces of candy. So he called up the, the friends that I'd went with, and uh, their parents looked through their candy, and lo and behold, there was pins in there as well. So it really does happen. It actually occurred in a little bitty place in the middle of nowhere that uh, you wouldn't think something like that would occur. What about theft? Uh, when I first moved out here to northern Kentucky, I bought a house, and the very first Halloween, I was gone for a couple hours, and somebody broke into my house. They did everything they could to pry open the windows. They couldn't get that window open. That was a good window. Uh, so finally, they just broke the door in and, and went in and stole a bunch of things. One of the things they stole was a bunch of uh, Christian CDs, <laughs> which was interesting. Hopefully, they listened to them and read the lyrics and got saved, but... Uh, you never know. But see, that stuff does happen. We also see spikes in uh, occult activity and crime spikes. Uh, Boston has released some of their statistics uh, for their crime spikes. And you can kind of see it on this chart. If you look on the left side, uh, there's a big spike right there at October 31st. And uh, what that is, that's about a 50% crime spike. This is over a three-year period of looking at those statistics. So it really does jump up. And I'd be curious to know what some other cities and uh, places uh, have for their crime spikes as well. Of course, you just can't look at every single one of them. But to get you thinking about this subject, Halloween and the Bible, I want, I want to pull up this cartoon. Take a look at this. What is biblically wrong with this picture? Now, I've had people go, ah, oh, well, these are all elements of, of Halloween. Oh, this is paganism. We've got to watch out for this. But think biblically. All those things were created by God, weren't they? 
Yeah, they were. You see, they're, they're things that God created. The problem with this is the order, okay? The pumpkin should be first because plants were made on day three. The moon is second. That was made on day four. The flying creatures, which include bats, that would have been made on day five. And then the uh, cat is the land animal that was made on day six. So it's the order of creation. We sometimes look at this and we're conditioned to think the way the world is where we say, ah, this is pagan stuff. We got to watch out for this stuff. No, these are things created by God. And what's happened is they've been hijacked or taken over uh, in a pagan worldview. So we just have to watch out for that. In fact, uh, when it comes to Halloween, there's a lot of things that have pagan roots. Consider, uh, for example, jack-o'-lanterns. There's some history of that that go back to uh, uh, pagan accounts, trick-or-treating, uh, costume masks, ghost stories, bobbing for apples, black cats, for example, you know, crossing your path, things like that. These are things that a lot of times are seen with pagan roots. Now, I know I've thrown that term out pagan quite often now, and you're probably wondering, what exactly is paganism? Well, let, let me give you the definition of paganism. A polytheistic or pantheistic nature-worshiping religion. Well, that didn't help much, did it? <laughs> uh, actually, let me explain this a little bit more. Poly means many. Theistic means God. Polytheistic, many God, multiple God systems. So anytime you see something like Greek mythology or uh, Norse mythology or Germanic mythology, Egyptian mythology, things like that, where it has many gods in it, that would be a, a forms of paganism. Pantheistic here, pan means uh, all, all, all is one here, essentially. Uh, pantheistic, basically the universe is God. Or all of nature is God. You almost worship the universe or the universe is all that there is, that type of a, a nature-worshiping religion. Now, thinking of this definition, all sorts of things are actually lumped under paganism. It's kind of like an overarching term for a multitude of religions. Obviously, it includes your mythological religions. It includes Wicca and witchcraft, uh, things like that. It also includes the occult. It can include Eastern religions. I know when I say that, a lot of people think Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism, in one sense, is kind of pagan, but in one sense, it's also not classed as pagan as well. The way I would t typically term uh, Hinduism is it has many elements of paganism, but isn't necessarily a, a typical form of paganism. I know some people have called it Indian paganism to try to distinguish it, but I think the easy way to think about it is it's got many elements of paganism. Uh, anything that has ancestor worship, you might think of thin, uh, Shinto of Japan or some of the other uh, uh, ancestor worship uh, type religions, the Druids, things like that. Nature worship, anytime people basically worship the universe, worship the creation instead of the creator, that is a form of paganism. That's warned against in Romans chapter 1. But I want you to understand that actually includes things like evolution and atheism, which simply look at the world and the universe as simply being all that there is. Uh, there was a man named uh, Carl Sagan. He was famous for an old TV series called Cosmos. Now, that series was uh, re more recently redone with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. But uh, Carl Sagan, look at one of the things he says here. He's an atheist and an evolution. Look what he says here. The cosmos is all that is, ever was, or ever will be. This was kind of his opening to his Cosmos series going back all the way to 1980. Do you realize that's a pagan statement? That's what that is. There is a connection between uh, paganism and an evolutionary worldview. Uh, the evolutionary worldview was actually developed by pagans. It was first uh, uh, promoted and developed by the Epicureans. Paul argued against the Epicureans in Acts chapter 17. That's one of the forms of Greek mythology. They were essentially the atheists and evolutionists of their day. And even nowadays, you'll see a number of uh, pagans who actually refer to evolution. A lot of times, they'll actually go hand in hand with each other. Well, when did modern day Halloween get started in the United States? Well, it actually goes back to an ancient group of people called the Celts. And many of you might be familiar with the Celtics, the Boston Celtics, a basketball team. They're actually named for the Celts. That's kind of where their name comes from. But the Celts are an ancient people group. Uh, typically, they were in uh, the northwestern part of Europe, uh, included places like uh, Ireland and the British Isles. That's where they ended up dominating. Now, they had a very popular empire at one stage. It spanned over much of Europe at one stage. But uh, a lot of the uh, uh, Irish and some of the Scots, when they were migrating to the United States in the mid-18 to early 1900s, actually brought Halloween with them over uh, because they were still celebrating that. And now it started to catapult, uh, you know, get up to the 1930s, 1950s. You start to see Halloween start to explode in the United States up to modern times. Well, who were these Celts? How does this relate to the Bible? Uh, if you actually go back in the Bible, we go back to the events at the Tower of Babel, and even before that, you have Noah after the flood. And we can actually track a lot of Noah's descendants, and one of Noah's grandsons, Gomer, that's where uh, places like France, Gaul or Gallia, uh, Gelt, Celt, these are actually variant names and forms of Gomer and his descendants. Uh, you'll also recognize some names up here, Galatia on the map. 
Uh, some of the Galatians fought and ended up down in Turkey, and uh, they were left there. Paul wrote a letter to the Galatians uh, there in the New Testament, just to give you an idea. So uh, a lot of the Celts dominated in uh, this uh, particular region of Europe, and many of them were descendants of Gomer. Now, you might think, well, it's that simple. They're descendants of Gomer. It's actually more complicated than this because you have other people groups in the area too. Uh, one of uh, Gomer's sons was Ashkenaz, and uh, this is basically where the Germanic peoples came from, uh, not just Germany and Austria and, uh, you know, places like that, some of the Norse lands, but also the Angles and the Saxons who migrated over to England, and uh, they ended up over in there. That's actually where the name England comes from. It, can, it comes from the Angles, which is one of the German tribes. Well, there's others as well. Magog, for example, there are three ancient lineages of Magog, uh, that uh, show descent uh, of the people of Ireland. There was a lot of mixing between the Irish and uh, the Scots as well. And another uh, one of Noah's grandsons was Tubal, who is where uh, Spain was. And a lot of them ended up migrating as far up as the British Isles, as well as into Gallia or Gaul or some of those Celtic lands. So you got a lot more going on in here than as simple as what I just initially put up there. Uh, these ancient Celts, uh, they had a festival, and it was actually run by the Druids. Uh, the Druids uh, had this festival called uh, Samhain, or Samhain is kind of how it was pronounced. It looks like Samhain, but that's uh, actually not how it's pronounced. But this festival goes back about 2,000 years ago. This is really where the roots of modern-day Halloween go to. Uh, it was basically a day of the dead. They offered sacrifices of animals, uh, plants, and uh, many times of people as well. Uh, sometimes their enemies, sometimes it was just some of their own innocence. And uh, many times this was to honor the dead. Well, I know I threw the name Druid out there. You probably wondered, who are the Druids? Uh, the Druids were essentially like the religious leaders or the scholars, the priestly class of uh, the Celts here who had emerged as the elite uh, essentially throughout Britain and Ireland. They had deviated to a path of paganism very similar to that of Hinduism. Uh, for example, they were polytheistic in their worldview. They had many gods, that is. Uh, they believed in a form of reincarnation. Basically, if you died, you would come back uh, in the form of someone else or as part of someone else or as part of the creation in general. Uh, and they had a form of ancestry worship here. Well, the Druids, just a little bit more about them. They tended to meet in groves, caves, and uh, remote valleys that they held sacred. They took over places like Stonehenge and Woodhens and uh, Castle Rig, Stone Circle. In fact, there's a number of these over there uh, in that particular area. But that's not the only place. These are actually ancient structures, and the Druids later on took them over. The Druids rose in prominence about 700 BC, even though the Celts go all the way back to the Tower of Babel, uh, just to kind of give you that little bit of a connection. But uh, many of these places were built before that, and the Druids simply took them over. Do you realize we actually find some stone circles like Stonehenge and Woodhenge over here in the Americas? If you go up to uh, uh, Beaver Island, for example, in Michigan, they have a couple of Stonehenges there, uh, kind of smaller in scope. Uh, one of them's actually submerged at this stage. We have some Woodhenges. One of them right up here just north of Cincinnati, some of the Native American uh, 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 tribes had actually built some of these. There's uh, a couple of them at Cahokia, Illinois, where the uh, Mississippian uh, uh, culture, uh, really, uh, their, their head up places right across from St. Louis was that. They have a couple of wood hinges there. But uh, essentially, the Druids kind of be rose in prominence after that and took over many of these places. Now, what I found was interesting here was they claimed, uh, that is the Druids here, they claimed descent, according to the Romans, of the Roman god Dees Potter. Now, you're probably like, what in the world did I just say right there? Potter means father. Uh, a lot of the, these people who had ancestor worship believed them to be gods. They were just their ancestors back in the past that they had elevated to a godlike status. It's not to be confused with the one true God of the Bible. But Dees was the name of that person. Well, the uh, Greek equivalent of that particular so-called god was Pluto. It's actually where the planet's name Pluto came from. Oh, wait, it's not a planet anymore. Back in my day, it was a planet. <laughs> But uh, that's where that name comes from. But that's actually a variant name of one of Noah's grandsons, Tubal, that we mentioned. So it does kind of make sense that uh, this would be one of the people uh, that they would look to for their ancestry. Well, where did the name Halloween come from? I know mean, we just mentioned that festival, uh, Samhain, uh, but where did the name Halloween come from? Because, boy, that just doesn't even connect, does it? Well, that actually goes back to a little bit of history with the church in particular, in the uh, A.D. 600s, uh, the church actually had a festival called All Saints Day, which was to honor the martyred dead of the church on May 13th. Now, what they ended up doing was because they had this Day of the Dead that just kept persisting, which occurred on November 1st, they decided, hey, let's move All Saints Day to November 1st. Okay, so they moved it then to kind of be a Christian alternative to that pagan Day of the Dead. Fact is, the All Saints Day became very popular 
And uh, it just uh, started to span all throughout Europe. It became a, a huge festival. They have ancient paintings, an example uh, uh, shown here of some of these festivals. Well, a little bit more to that. The evening before All Saints Day became known as All Hallows' Eve or All Hallows' Even, or it was simply uh, reduced to Halloween. And that was on October 31st. See, a lot of people don't realize at sunset, October 31st, that's when the Samhain Festival began and it ended at the end of the day on November 1st, basically at sunset around then. We don't think of the, uh, the day as beginning and ending like that, but that's the way they kind of looked at that. So basically the day before became a big festival as well. So it almost became a two-day festival. Well, because the Day of the Dead, that uh, Celtic Samhain festival continued to persist, finally what the church did was, well, you know what, let's just have All Souls Day on November 2nd. And they almost mixed the holidays, if you want to call them holidays like that, together. Uh, on November 2nd, and that way they had a three-day event. And going down to today, Halloween's the one that dominates uh, out of all that. Well, don't other cultures have a day of the dead? Actually, there's quite a few. Uh, back in ancient times, Rome had one. A lot of people don't uh, put the connection together here, but Rome was right in here. The Celts were right up here. The Roman Empire ended up dominating much of the Celtic land. Now, you would have thought, okay, the Romans have a day of the dead. The Celts have a day of the dead. Did one overpower the other? Well, not really. What happened is they basically fueled each other. Uh, that Roman Day of the Dead, it was actually a three-part festival. One of them, uh, it began with Parentalia and it ended with Feralia, if I'm saying that right. I've anglicized it here. Uh, but they basically fueled each other. The Day of the Dead just continued to persist as a result. Now, when I say Day of the Dead, many of you guys out in my audience today would probably recognize that uh, over here in the United States, uh, our southern neighbor, Mexico, has, is very famous for their Day of the Dead, aren't they? Yeah, they celebrate that quite often. We have a lot of people from Mexico that have migrated up to the United States, and they brought the Day of the Dead with them. We're, we're fairly familiar with that one. Well, that's just three. Do you realize Days of the Dead appear all over the world? The Aztec, the Olmec, the Iroquois, Bolivia has one. The people in Brazil have one. You go over to places like Asia. China has one, the Ghost Festival, for example. Uh, Japan has the Bon or the Oban Festival here. Now, there was a movie a number of years ago, not that I'm advocating going out watching some of these movies because a lot of these movies have some pretty bad things in it, but there was a movie series called Karate Kid. And uh, this is the old one. Apparently, there was a new one. If you guys remember the old Karate Kid uh, did something like that. Well, in that movie, they go over to Japan. And while they're over there, they're celebrating this huge festival. And a lot of people don't realize what that festival was. That was their Day of the Dead. That was their Bon or the Oban Festival. They, they sometimes watch these things and they've not been able to discern uh, what is going on there in the background of these things. So you have to watch out for that. Uh, Vietnam has one, Nepal, Korea, uh, even the Hindi in uh, India have one, Philippines have one. They're all over the place. I'm just giving you a sample of some of these. So when you think, okay, you have the, the, the Celts who have their Day of the Dead, the Romans have one, the Mexico has them, they're all over the world. Is there a connection between them? Is there a connection between Halloween and the other Days of the Dead? I would suggest that there is. If you start looking at the commonalities of the Days of the Dead, uh, many times it was to honor the dead, the ancestors, the souls. This is all across the world. Uh, many of these were at the end of summer uh, to mid-fall. Uh, many of them actually matched up fairly well with the Celtic Day of the Dead there toward the end of October, beginning in November. Uh, oftentimes, it was for remembrance of sins. Uh, it was a time to have sacrifices. And what I would suggest is, you know what? All of these go back when the cultures were connected. It goes all the way back to the events that occurred at the Tower of Babel. So what is the original source of Halloween and other Days of the Dead? Do you realize scholars have recognized this? Uh, you go back when Halloween started to gain in prominence, uh, for example, in the 1930s. A uh, scholar here, he recognized this, and he had a connection all the way back to the flood sacrifices. Remember Noah? After the flood, he offered sacrifices of all the clean animals. That was essentially a yearly sacrifice led all the way up to Babel, and then from Babel, people split to different parts of the world. You know, other scholars have recognized this as well. Dr. Alfred Ray Winkle, he's a professor of theology at Concordia. This was back in the 1950s. Uh, he recognized these guys all have a day dead, and he directly related this to the flood of Noah's day. So is the event of Noah's sacrifice where the day of the dead really originates? Well, it's possible. It was a time when there was sacrifice to cover sins and a reminder of why death reigns in this sin-cursed world. It was a spiritual time, a time when people remembered that a disaster, the global flood, took virtually the entire population as a punishment for sin. Halloween's roots could easily extend this far. Now, here's what's interesting. The sacrifices of Noah were not the first sacrifices in the Bible. 
Sacrifice actually went back before Noah. So let's take a look at this. What is the relationship between sacrifice and the word of God? You know, the God of the Bible is a perfect God, isn't he? He's a perfect God. A perfect God made a perfect creation. That's what we expected from a perfect God. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says he's a rock. Speaking of God here. His work is perfect. We expected the work of creation to be perfect. That's what we expected. At the end of the creation week, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. It really was. It was very good. It was perfect. That's what we expected. Imagine a perfect world for a second. A world with no death, no bloodshed, no suffering, kids, no homework. Yeah, men, no baldness. Yeah, perfect world, wasn't it? Everything was perfect. But you see, everything changed because we're not in a perfect world anymore. And that brings us to sin. Remember that serpent influenced by Satan? Deceived the woman to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, if, if Adam and Eve had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there was a problem, wasn't there? Genesis 2, 17 says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You see, the punishment for sin is death. Adam and Eve realized they were naked. They were ashamed. They immediately went and took some fig leaves and sewed fig leaves together, made coverings from themselves. That was crazy. Have you ever felt a fig leaf? That makes the worst possible clothing. But you see, those fig leaf clothings weren't good enough. The punishment for sin was death, so the solution had to involve death. Look what the Lord did in Genesis 3.21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. You see, this is the first recorded death of anything in Scripture. The Lord essentially sacrificed animals to cover that sin. You know, we oftentimes picture that as a lamb in our children's books and at the Creation Museum. And we do that as a foreshadow of Jesus Christ, who's called the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. But notice, this was a blood sacrifice, essentially. In fact, because of sin, everything changed in the world. That's why we see death and suffering and, and all those horrible atrocities. We see all sorts of terrible things. We see natural disasters. We see tyrants destroy and kill their people. It's just terrible. But you know, we're in a culture that sees those things. They see what people like Hitler and Stalin have done in the past. They've seen other types of horrible atrocities. And they cry out and they say, God, why'd you make the world like this? Or they see a, a tsunami and an earthquake that goes in and wipes out tons of people along coastlines. They say, God, why, why'd you do this? Why, why'd you make the world like this? They see the Twin Towers or and you name the atrocity. And they cry out and they say, God, why? They see a world that's full of joy and sorrow. They see a world that's full of life and death. They see a world of love and hate. And they say, God, why'd you make the world like this? And you see, what it is is they don't have a proper understanding of the Bible. If you go back to the early pages of the Bible, God made everything perfect. It's because of man's sin that the world is like this. You see, it's essentially our fault. Because of man's sin, that's why death is in the world. It is a punishment for sin. You know, Adam lived 930 years. And according to the Bible... He died. His son Seth, he died. All through Genesis chapter 5, people died. Well, with the exception of Enoch. Enoch was taken straight to heaven without death. You know, that always makes an interesting trivia question, doesn't it? Who is the longest lived person in the Bible that died, that's recorded in the Bible, and yet his father outlived him? And that is Methuselah. He lived 969 years, and yet his father never died. <laughs> Quite interesting. But even the very last verse of the book of Genesis, so Joseph died. See, the punishment for sin was death, and death reigned as a result of sin. Well, let's go back there to those early pages. Adam and Eve sinned. They get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They have Cain, Abel. They have Seth. They have other sons and daughters in Genesis 5-4. So originally, brothers and sisters had to marry. I've got two beautiful sisters, but friends, that's not happening. <laughs> It was the time of Moses in Leviticus chapter 18. That's when God said no more close intermarriage. Uh, Abraham married his half-sister Sarah, for example. Moses' his father actually married his aunt, uh, Jochebed. Uh, but it was after the time of Moses. God said no more of that. But see, notice with Abel. Abel offered fat portions, and that was an acceptable sacrifice. He mimicked what the Lord did. Cain offered his first fruits. Not that first fruits are bad, but that wasn't the sacrifice required. You needed that blood sacrifice. So the Lord respected Abel's sacrifice. Uh, Noah offered sacrifices in Genesis 8.20. This is after the flood. He offered of each of the uh, clean animals there. He wasn't the only one. 
All the way from that point, all the way up through Babel, as it spread about, people were offering sacrifices. We still see people around the world who are still offering sacrifices even today. But look at the Bible. Abraham offered sacrifices. The Israelites offered sacrifices. And that is all pointing to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate sacrifice. Do you realize, Christians, we don't sacrifice today because Christ's sacrifice was sufficient. Let's look at some big picture theology. The punishment from an infinite God is an infinite punishment. Are animals infinite? No. The best they could do was cover that sin. They couldn't really satisfy God's wrath upon that sin. What we needed was a perfect, infinite sacrifice that could take the infinite punishment from the infinite Father. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is infinite, he could take that punishment. Only he was in a position to do that. So the infinite Son stepped into history to become a man, and he took the infinite punishment from the infinite Father. And that was enough to satisfy God's wrath upon sin. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that's Jesus Christ here, became a life-giving spirit. You see, Hebrews 9, 26 says, he then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, Jesus has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He was that ultimate sacrifice. He did it once for all. He doesn't have to do it over and over again. His sacrifice was sufficient. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Do you realize that Christ by right, should never have been able to die on the cross. You know why? The punishment for sin is death. Was Christ a sinner? No. By rights, he shouldn't have been able to die on that cross. He should have just been able to suffer. You know why he was able to die on that cross? Because he bore our sin. Our sin was taken on Christ on that cross. Oh, how precious is his blood. 1 John 1, 7. You see, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, that's more of a proper understanding of sacrifice, of sin, and the relationship between sin and death and what Christ did to save us on that cross. Now, let's step back and get a, get a better perspective of the world. Let's get a biblical perspective of the world. You see, God made the world perfect. It's because of man's sin that the world is in the situation that it's in. That's why death and disease and struggling and suffering extinctions exist in our world today. But Christ steps into history to save us from sin and death, and there'll be a new heavens and a new earth where there will be no more death, no more suffering. That's something to look forward to. Let me liken it like this. Let's say you're looking at a statue, like one of those ancient Greek or Roman statues, for example. People sometimes look at it and they say, look how wonderful and marvelous and inspiring and beautiful it is. Sometimes you need to step back and say, what are you looking at? It looks broken to me. <laughs> you see? Same thing with the world. Oh, it looks wonderful. It looks marvelous and inspiring. It's so beautiful. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a remnant of beauty out there. We still see that. But overall, it's broken. We need to step back and say, what are you talking about? What are you looking at? It looks broken to me. You see, if we go all the way back to the early pages of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, the ground is cursed because of man's sin. Romans chapter 8 confirms this. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. You see, that's why we need a new heavens and a new earth. That's why we need the curse to be removed. And the last two chapters of Revelation actually talk about the new heavens and the new earth, the curse being removed. There'll be no more death. That is something exciting to look forward to. Well, let's get a biblical timeline of these events. I know I've been throwing different things out here, the Druids, the Celts, and, and everything that's going on here. Let, let's just look at this biblically. Uh, if we start creation, we go back here, early pages of the Bible here. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, most chronologists actually arrive at that about 4,000 B.C. I've actually tallied up numbers very similar to Usher, and I'll talk about that here in just a moment. But uh, not long after the creation, that's when Adam and Eve sinned against God. Very soon after. It was before Adam and Eve conceived their first child, Cain. So a lot of people put that right away. That's when sacrifice was first instituted. And then we have sacrifices with Noah after the flood. The flood sacrifices here. I'm just following Usher's chronologies, uh, at least fairly similar here. Uh, then we have uh, those sacrifices leading all the way up to the Tower of Babel. As people go to different parts of the world, they take that sacrifice with them. It starts to get corrupted over the years as people paganize it and destroy it and change its meaning. 
And then you start to see the, the Celts dominate much of uh, uh, Europe here in 700 BC. Just to give you a time reference, I put Abraham in here about 2000 BC. But the Celts begin to dominate. And out of the Celts, you see the Druids start to raise as the elite around this particular time. I put Christ in here as a time reference just to give you an idea. And then uh, the church's response with the uh, All Saints Day, with uh, All Hallows Even, and then you see All Souls Day, for example, in here as well. And uh, that brings us to the Irish Celts, for example, as one of those groups bringing Halloween to the United States beginning in the 1840s leading up to today. Well, how should Christians respond to Halloween's paganism? First things first, I think we need to be discerning, shouldn't we? We need to start training ourselves in this issue, training our children, training our churches uh, in apologetics, not just around Halloween, which I encourage, but also around creation in general. Being able to defend the authority of the Bible in today's day and age is of utmost importance. Otherwise, we could get blown to every wind of doctrine that the world keeps throwing at us. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, this is the Great Commission. Jesus says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. You see, we're, we're supposed to go out and make disciples. Uh, we're supposed to teach them to observe all things that Christ has commanded. Hey, do you realize Christ is God and the word of God is right here? This is what Christ commanded. You see, we're supposed to be teaching people to observe all of this, to understand it, to make disciples. You know, that's almost a lost art in many churches across this country, isn't it? But you know, that would be significant. I, I suggest we need to start doing that. Because you know what? When you don't have the word of God grounded, you struggle. You know, the Bible warns in 2 Corinthians 11.3, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see, if we don't get discipled, if we're not taught all that Christ has commanded, we may be led astray by false ideas, particular false ideas of our day. You see, in our day, there's a battle. There's a battle over two religions. I want you to understand there's only two religions in the world. That's it, just two. Gods and not gods. You understand that? Two, that's it. All the other world religions that are out there, one way or another, have to borrow from man's ideas. You see, man would be seen as the authority, one way or another, to be superseding God and his word. You see, in a broad sense, that's a battle over Christianity versus humanism, in as broad a sense, that is. See, humanism is whenever man's ideas have been elevated to supersede God and his word. And there's a lot of forms of it. Now, in our popular culture today, our humanism that we tend to encounter all the time is an evolutionary, atheistic type of a worldview. Things uh, with Big Bang, millions of years in evolution, for example. You see, these are subsets to the religion of, say, secular humanism in the same way that creation, the fall, and the flood are subsets to the religion of Christianity. You see, it's a battle over two different religions. Now, I've had people say, now, hold on a second, Bodie. Isn't it, isn't it science versus the Bible? No, you know, I've got a master's degree in mechanical engineering. I developed a new method of production of submicron titanium diboride. That was English, by the way. <laughs> but you know, what I can tell you about science is science is observable and repeatable. Has anyone ever observed or repeated the Big Bang? No. Has anyone ever observed or repeated millions of years? No. Has anyone ever observed or repeated the changing of a single-celled organism like an amoeba into a cow? Never seen it. You see, that's not science. You know what that is? That is a religion that is being imposed upon people as though it were good, operational, observable science. And we're not seeing that. Now, there's a lot of forms of humanism floating around in our culture. There's secular humanism or secularism. Atheism, which says there's no God. There's new atheism, very aggressive form of atheism. They're trying to impose atheism upon uh, uh, generations of people. You have agnosticism, which says we can't know if God exists. In fact, in agnosticism, you can't know anything. It's Quite an interesting religion out there. Uh, when people say they're not religious, that's a fancy way of saying you're a humanist because you've already elevated your own thoughts to be greater than God and his word. It's a form of paganism, essentially. Uh, naturalism, or even paganism itself and all the forms that fit under it. But I would go so far as to say any worldview that deviates from God and his word, one way or another, have humanistic elements in them. But notice paganism here. And see, in our culture today, this evolutionary paganism is rampant. And what breaks my heart is many Christians say, hey, we can take some of these things, maybe the Big Bang, maybe, maybe some evolution, maybe some millions of years, maybe we can take some of that and we can just mix it with our Christianity. What happens if you mix two different religions like that? Do they mix? 
No, they don't. Usually something has to give. And usually Christians start giving up the Bible. Well, maybe a day doesn't mean a day. Maybe those evenings and mornings aren't evenings and mornings. Maybe the sun was made on day one instead of day four. They just start rearranging it. They start messing with it. All because they're trying to take modern pagan ideas and mix it with the Bible. You know, was the Lord happy with the Israelites when they took the Baal worship, which is paganism in their day and age? Was the Lord happy with them when they took that and started to mix it? No, he wasn't. The Lord was not happy at all. Well, how should Christians respond to some of this evolutionary paganism? Well, first things first, we need to be discerning. Let's keep that in mind. On these issues, we always need to be discerning. You know, the Bible warns about deception. Jesus said it. Take heed that you be not deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived, says Paul. James says, do not be deceived. Do you realize Christians can be deceived? We can all be deceived. You know, I've looked at my own past. There's times I've been deceived on a great many things. And it took me getting back to the word of God to get correct thinking on things. It took God to do that. But see, notice in our culture. We're in a culture today that teaches things, sometimes in a very subtle way. Notice the progression here. Trick. Hmm. You see, we're in a culture that teaches millions and billions of years in an evolutionary worldview as though it's a fact, as though it's the truth. And people celebrate it as though it's some wonderful truth. And many times, Christians are influenced by this type of stuff. Should we be influenced by that? We need to step back and take a look. You know, Christians can be deceived by these things. For example, let me, let me just do one example. If I were to go to many Christian audiences around this country and I mentioned the tree of life, do you think they would automatically think of the tree of life that's mentioned in the Garden of Eden right next to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? You think they'd think of that? Some of them probably would. But you know what most of them would probably end up thinking of? If I say tree of life, they'd probably think of Darwin's tree of life. Because do you realize 90% of Christian kids, for example, actually attend state schools where they're taught Darwin's tree of life year after year after year? That's most likely what they're going to look up. This is Darwin's tree of life. Everything goes back to a single-celled organism, essentially. And, of course, there's more modern forms of it. And see, a lot of times, uh, people don't recognize this isn't even a tree of life. You know what it is? It's a tree of death. You see, I want you to understand, in an evolutionary, paganistic worldview like that, death is essentially the hero of the plot. You have to have death to get things out of the way so that the next phase of evolution can occur. You see, death is almost like the ultimate aspect right there next to time. You know, it's interesting. Proverbs 8.36 says, but he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. You see, in an evolutionary worldview, death is that hero. Carl Sagan also said, the secrets of evolution are time and death. You see, time plus death is what ultimately leads up to man's existence in an evolutionary worldview. You see, you have to have that millions of years of death, pain, struggling, suffering, leading up to man's existence. You just have to have it there in an evolutionary worldview. I mean, if you don't have millions of years, let's say you have uh, 5,000 years of earth history, would anybody possibly propose an evolutionary worldview? No. They have to have millions and billions of years in there. Well, where does that idea of millions and billions of years come from? It actually comes from fossil layers. You see, in the evolutionary worldview, what they do is they look at fossil layers. They look at these rock layers and they say, ah, let's assume there were no catastrophes in the past. Did you catch that? That's a crazy assumption, isn't it? But that's the assumption they operate on, that there were no catastrophes in the past and that each one of these little rock layers were laid down slowly and gradually over long ages, millions and billions of years long. And you look in those rock layers, you see death, pain, struggling, suffering, extinction, thorns, things like that. And they say, ah, all this millions of years leads up to man's existence. Well, don't some Christians believe in millions of years too? Sadly, yeah. But you know what they're doing? They're taking the world's ideas about that and they're mixing it with the Bible. They're assuming there was no catastrophes in the past like a global flood. Do you realize that? And you know what? When Christians buy into things like millions of years, they run into a problem, particularly on the issue of death. Consider for a moment, if you have millions and billions of years of death, pain, struggling, suffering before Adam sinned, then death, pain, struggling, suffering, and extinctions, and thorns, and things like that are all a very good thing, aren't they? What really was the punishment for sin? You see, you run into a problem, especially when somebody loses a loved one, or something happens. They say, oh God, you're the one who made the world like this. It's all your fault, instead of it being man's sin. Do you realize this affects a lot of people when churches do this sort of thing? Let's just use a couple of examples of people who've walked away from any form of faith 
in God and his word. Ted Turner, he had a little bit of a background in the church. He understood who God was, understood a little bit about the Bible. But look at this. Turner is a strident non-believer, having lost his faith after his sister, Mary Jane, died of a painful disease. Look what he says here. I was taught that God was love and God was powerful. I couldn't understand how someone so innocent should be made or allowed to suffer. What he didn't understand was it's because of sin that the world is like this. He should have hated sin. Instead, he blamed God for it. He understood death is a bad thing and he wanted to blame God for it. Here's another one, Charles Darwin. You know, his wife attended a Unitarian cult that they had bought into millions of years. Millions of years preceded Darwin by a little bit. But look at this, Annie's cruel death destroyed Charles Tatter's belief in a moral, just universe. Later, he would say that this period chimed the final death knell for his Christianity. St. Charles, look at the way they wrote this, St. Charles now took his stand as an unbeliever. You see, if you have millions and billions of years of death, pain, struggling, and suffering, and God did it that way, you don't have an answer for why there's death and suffering. Fact is, why would you need Jesus to save you from that kind of stuff if that's the way that God made the world? It's a big problem. But see, I want you to understand something that occurred with these gentlemen. You know, when looking at God, they saw death as a bad thing. But they wanted to blame God for that death instead of blaming sin. But look at this. Look what they did. They then walked away from any form of godly worldview, and they moved over to an evolutionary religion that then hailed death as the hero. They saw death as a bad thing, and then they move over and they start to worship it, essentially. You see what's happening, and we see this within our culture. We go out and we point out that God is good and God is loving. And then there's that issue of death and suffering, the problem of evil that just seems to reign over people. It's like a vice that just comes in and starts squeezing that out. But we're not to be conformed to the world. What we need to do is get back to the Bible. What does the Bible say about this? Well, if you go back to the Bible, a perfect God made a perfect creation. It's because of man's sin that death and suffering is in the world. But take heart, Jesus stepped into history to die on a cross for us sinners. Friends, that is a loving God, someone who would lay down his life for his friends. You see, when you have a proper biblical understanding of it, it destroys that vice. You see, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So let's just look at that millions of years for just a brief moment. Those rock layers that the world say took millions and billions of years to get laid down. You see, many kids are pretty familiar with the geologic time scale. There's technical versions of this. You know what, creationists and evolutionists, we all agree on this, uh, one aspect of this anyway. The rock layers, those are real rock layers. There really is uh, Ordovician uh, rock layer, Permian rock layer. What we disagree is the timing. In the secular world where they say it took 75 million years to lay down that Ordovician or 50 million years to lay down that Permian rock, we do think in terms of a global flood. We do think in terms of a catastrophe in the past. We're not limited like the world is. Global flood sediment. Boom. Laid down the majority of those rock layers with fossils over the course of that year-long flood. Now, we've had rock layers since the time of the flood, but the majority would have come from the flood of Noah's day. You see, that's where those rock layers come from. They're not evidence of millions and billions of years. They're evidence of the flood of Noah's day. But notice, the millions of years virtually vanishes in light of a global flood. Well, how old is the earth then? If you just look at the Bible, how old's the earth? Well, I think they gave us three hours in here, so let's go ahead and start adding up those genealogy. You guys don't want to do that, huh? I'm telling you, if you're ever having trouble sleeping, don't count sheep, don't take an Ambien, book of numbers. Won't take long at all. Let's do a short uh, estimate here. You know, if you just flip to the Ten Commandments, let's start the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. You see, six days. You know, Moses and Israelites took this as six normal length days. You rest for a normal length day. So it's a normal creation week here. The earth was created on day one. Adam was made on day six. That's about five days in between there. Now, if you add up those genealogies from Adam to Abraham, and most people can do that. That's in Genesis 5 and Genesis chapter 11. You get about 2,000 years. Uh, You can follow the genealogies. Uh, For example, uh, in Genesis chapter 5 here, it gives you all that chronological data. You can just tally it right up. It's simple addition. Start with Adam, you go all the way down here, a couple up from the bottom is Abraham, you move over, it's about 2,000 years after creation. Now, most scholars, Christian or secular, completely agree that Abraham lived about 2,000 years before Christ, which is 4,000 years ago from today, so from a rough estimate, you get about 6,000 years. Now, uh, some famous chronologists, Archbishop James Usher, for example, arrived at 4,004 BC, he did this in the 1600s, 
And uh, Sir Isaac Newton uh, defended this date. Now, Isaac Newton was arguably one of the greatest scientists who ever lived. Keep that in mind. More recently, Floyd Nolan Jones also arrived at 4004 BC in his book, The Chronology of the Old Testament. Now, they don't agree on every point because there's a few places it's not straightforward to calculate, but by and large are in general agreement. And you know what? There's been a host of chronologists who've been able to tally this up over the last uh, 2,000 years, going all the way back to church fathers. I even have a handful of new ones that I've been able to find, and this isn't even including the Jewish counts. But you'll notice there's quite a few here, and they hover on each side of 4004 BC, some a little more, some a little bit less. In fact, I decided to tally this up recently. I went from creation all the way up to uh, when the Israelites come out of captivity, and I didn't want to look at anybody else's stuff. I just wanted to do it in the Bible, and I tallied it up, and then I looked at some of the chronologists, and I was actually four years off from Archbishop James Usher, so I was kind of excited about that. He had a couple of places where a father and son were a co-regents, and uh, I didn't have that, so he's probably right. I'll have to go back and take a look, but uh, the point is you don't get millions and billions of years of death out of the Bible. Instead, what you find is death is the punishment for sin, and that's why we need a Savior in Jesus Christ to save us from sin and death. So what is the connection between paganism and evolution? Did you ever stop to think about that? Well, remember, evolution can be a form of paganism, by the way. They both oppose God and his word. They're both humanistic worldviews. They've got those overlaps there. But notice this. This is what I want to point out. They both tend to love death. They both do. Remember that evolutionary worldview? They tend to love death. Remember what Proverbs says here about that? All those who hate me love death. The secrets of evolution, their time and death, that's, that's the secret of evolution, according to Carl Sagan, according to many evolutionists. You have to have that millions of years of death, bloodshed, and suffering to lead up to man's existence. I want you to understand death is the hero in an evolutionary worldview. Now compare this to the pagans. Pagan cultures all over the world going back for thousands of years. They very much loved death. They oftentimes sacrificed people to try to make their culture better. They thought it would, it would make things better. You know, the Romans and the Greeks and people had actually commented on some of the sacrifice that the Druids and the pagans had done. They would build these big cages that looked like people. They would put people and hay in them and some animals, and they light it on fire. They did all sorts of terrible things. But look at some of the modern things going on in an evolutionary worldview with people like Hitler. He was trying to wipe out people like the Jews, the Poles and the Gypsies, a number of others actually as well. Christians were even on his target list. He was trying to make a better society by sacrificing people. What about Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood? The most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. You realize we're in a culture that just promotes this paganistic idea where death is still the hero. In an evolutionary worldview, in a pagan worldview, death is the hero. They overlap on this. 1 Corinthians 10, 20. This is Paul here. No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. We need to watch out for this kind of stuff. And in this time, this day and age where Halloween glorifies in death, do you realize that's what it does? They glorify in the death. They glorify in the pagan aspects of it. We need to watch out for those types of things. I've had people say, well, is paganism dangerous then? Yes, it can be very dangerous. In ancient times, they oftentimes killed a lot of people. It was quite dangerous. But, you know, we find that even in modern times. There's a shooter in Oregon. Mercer was his name. He was a pagan. The Oregon gunman who lined up his victims and asked specifically which ones were Christians before shooting them execution style had a special interest in magic and spiritualism. That's paganism. That's what it is. Look what he says here. Under the category of religious views, he wrote that he is not religious. That's a form of paganism. That's a form of humanism right there. But look at this. He is spiritual and was interested in pagan and Wiccan. Well, of course. That's because he's pagan. His lifestyle was right after that. Now, it's interesting. Mercer, who claimed that he didn't believe in the God of the Bible, he claimed he was not religious. Look what he said to his victims. Oh, you're a Christian? Well, you're about to see God. You know, this pagan... And his heart of hearts knew God existed. He knew it. That's what he was lashing out against. He was trying to suppress the knowledge of God. That's what Romans chapter 1 talks about. People trying to suppress that. You see, all those who hate me love death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, Paul describes death as an enemy that needs to be destroyed. You see, death is an enemy in a Christian worldview. We don't glorify in it. We don't love death. Death is the enemy And Christ conquered that death on a cross. 
Revelation 21, 4 says, there'll be no more death in the new heavens and the new earth. That is something to be excited about. But see, that's a Christian viewpoint, not a pagan or an evolutionary viewpoint. Well, how did we arrive in such a paganized culture? Well, consider the, the, the verse in Judges here. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. What happens when people start to reject the king of kings? They do whatever's right in their own eyes, which could be anything. And we're seeing that. I mean, consider what the Bible says about the mind of unbelievers. Titus 1.15, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their minds and consciences are defiled. Romans 1, 20 through 21. Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Romans 1 continues. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. They were backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful. It, the list goes on. Second Corinthians even says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. When the Lord gave them over to a debased mind, he basically gave them over to Satan, the God of this world. It blinds them. Second Timothy confirms this. Look at this. Only through God could they escape the snare of the devil. They've been taken captive by him to do his will. You know, I put a lot of verses up there on that, but I want you to understand, the unbelieving mind cannot think properly on these issues. They have a debased mind. So what do debased minds do with the knowledge of God? It's very simple. They destroy it. Uh, they warp it. They deviate from it. They suppress it. They turn from it. I mean, consider the mind of unbelievers. If they can't think right about like true history, they, they distort it. Or moral issues, they destroy it. Uh, sin and death, they turn from it. Christ and God, they distort who he is. I mean, consider, let's just look at history for a moment. Do you realize if you look back at ancient history from paganized cultures, do you realize they have creator legends all the time? A lot of times they replace the God of the Bible with someone like Odin, one of their ancestors that's found in King's List, by the way. Paganized creation legends. Paganized flood legends, we have over 300 flood legends all over the world. And they deviate from what the scripture says. They've lost information. They've embellished things. Paganized Tower of Babel legends, we find those all over the world as well. Why would we not expect that sacrifice gets paganized and destroyed as people to take it to different parts of the world? We expect them to destroy it. Sacrifice as they take it to various parts. Psalm 118.8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And yet what's so often is many of these people, they've walked away from God, the knowledge of God, and so they stand on man's ideas and it gets destroyed. You see, in the Old Testament, they had to deal with this. They had to deal with paganism in the Old Testament. Do you realize that? There's a number of places, Leviticus here in the law where Moses is talking to him. Uh, you know, you got to watch out for those who are practicing divination or soothsaying. Give no regard to mediums or familiar spirits. Deuteronomy 18. Look at this. Watch out for those who are practicing witchcraft or a soothsayer, one who interprets omens or a sorcerer, one who conjures spells or medium or a spiritist or one who calls upon the dead. Remember Saul? King Saul went to a medium. Was the Lord happy with him? Not at all. Even our wise King Solomon. Nevertheless, pagan women even caused him to sin. See, we have to watch out for this. They had to deal with this in the Old Testament. Do you realize they had to deal with it in the New Testament as well? Paul in Galatians, chapter 5 here, 19 through 21, talks about uh, some of the works of the flesh here. Look at this, you have to watch out for the idolatry and the sorcery. These people, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God unless they repent, receive Christ as Lord and Savior. 1 Corinthians 12, 2, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. You know what I like about this verse compared to a lot of these others? It goes to show pagans can get saved. I love to see pagans repent and receive Jesus Christ. But you see, they were led astray to mute idols. But let's not forget, modern paganization, it's occurring right under our noses. An evolutionary worldview is pagan. Consider that. It's a form of Epicureanism that's just reared its ugly head in today's day and age. But look at the paganization of other things. Let's just look at Christmas, for example. 
Santa Claus. The paganization of Christmas. St. Nicholas was a great guy. And yet, St. Nicholas has been corrupted into Santa Claus. And now, Santa Claus apparently lives at the North Pole. He has omnipresent powers, and he's the keeper of the naughty or nice list. They take an attributes of God, and they apply it to him. That's paganism. See the same thing with Frosty the Snowman, and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. People are more about that than to see the Lord and Savior step into history. What about the resurrection? People are more about an Easter bunny and eggs than they are about the risen Savior. What about the United States, UK, other parts of the Western world? Our Constitution actually says in the year of our Lord in reference to Jesus Christ. And yet if a teacher in a state school says in the year of our Lord, they're liable to get fired for it because there's a separation of church and state. It's unconstitutional to say that. And yet there it is in the Constitution. You see, the pagans have taken over this country. That's what's happening. That's what we're seeing. Breaks my heart. We're seeing the paganization of the rainbow. A rainbow is a promise from God that he will never again Send a flood, as he did in Noah's day, to destroy all life. You see, that's a natural rainbow you get to see up in the sky. And yet people are lighting up these artificial rainbows and trying to change the meaning of the rainbow. That's paganization. Paganization of you fill in the blanks, all sorts of stuff. Let's just get back to the cross for a moment. Let's go back to the cross. You know, if a teacher were to put a cross up in their school, they could probably be fired. Because the cross is seen as a symbol of Christianity, isn't it? But I want you to understand what the cross was a symbol of. The cross was a symbol of death. That's what it was. The Romans, if somebody crossed Rome, they could die on a cross, a very painful, horrific, slow death in front of everyone to see. And they leave those crosses up so that people could see it. It was a reminder, you don't cross Rome. It was a symbol of death. And yet Jesus Christ conquered death on a cross. One of the most horrendous forms of death. 2 Peter 2.24 who himself, this is Christ here, bore our sins in his own body on that tree. You see, essentially the cross is like a, like a tree of life, if I can put it in quotes here, by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 4.12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved. It is only through Jesus Christ. Romans 5.10, do you realize we were once enemies who have been reconciled to God? We were once enemies till the Holy Spirit got in there and saved us. You know, I want you to understand the pagans, they're not the enemy. The evolutionists, the atheists, they're not the enemy. The enemy is the false philosophy that they bought into. What they need to understand is that is a false philosophy and they need to get back to the truth. We need to be praying for them. We want to see them come to know the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as well. Hebrews 2, 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We have a phenomenal salvation to take to the world. Phenomenal one. We need to take salvation to the world. We need to share it with the world. We need to share it with the pagans. We need to share it to people. You see, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and we want to see the world renewing their mind as well. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that's how you have the removal of the veil. That's how you escape the snare of the devil. That's how you have eternal life. That's how you're saved from death. So let me leave you with this. Should Christians involve themselves in Halloween? It's a good question, isn't it? It's a really good question. Let me uh, give you some options that I've heard from different people. I mean, obviously consult your local church. Um, I'm sure just about any local church out there that stands on the authority of the Bible would say, we gotta avoid the pagan practices need to avoid that stuff. There's problems with it. You know, I've talked to some people who are saying, you know what, well, we're going to try to take it back. But let's have a time where we actually go back and talk about sacrifice and where sacrifice comes from, how that goes back to the Bible and how that points to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've had some people say, maybe we can just avoid Halloween altogether. You know, it's tough to do. You know, I've got some kids and we can't even go to a grocery shop without seeing a whole aisle on Halloween. It's tough to avoid it, isn't it? In fact, at a local grocery store, they pass out stickers to my kids that have a witch on it. There they are promoting paganism right there to your kids. We see this all over the place. Breaks my heart to see that. I mean, do these same grocery stores pass out something that says Jesus is risen? No, they don't. It's tough to just avoid it. 
I had a three-year-old that hit me hard here recently when my three-year-old was turning four and said, hey, what are we doing for Halloween? I said, you know, we're Christians. Let's have a talk. I had to sit down and talk with them. See, kids are hit hard with it. It's all over the place. I've had some people say, well, maybe we can have an alternative. For example, some people do harvest festivals. There's nothing wrong with that. Praising the Lord, giving thanks for what he's given to us. There's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people celebrate Reformation Day. I want to encourage that too, by the way. Do you realize that the day that the 95 theses of Luther were nailed to the door there at Wittenberg, October 31st, that was the final nail that triggered the Reformation. A lot of people celebrate Reformation Day. I want to encourage that too, by the way. Some churches do trunk or treat. You see, uh, it's quite interesting to see a trunk or treat because it involves getting a lot of candy to kids. If you talk to kids and say, you know what, we have a problem with Halloween. I'm not so sure you should be out there doing some of these things that these pagans are doing. And they say, but what about the candy? Well, there's alternatives that you can do. And if you give the kids the candy, usually they're just fine with getting candy without having to celebrate pagan aspects. Some people do prayer meetings, offer kids candy during prayer meetings and stuff too. You know, there's a number of things. And you know what? I want to encourage you. Talk to your local church. Find out. Because you know what? They've had to deal with it for years as well. But here's what I suggest. In all things, friends, couch all this with the gospel. Let's not forget why we do this, why we talk about these issues, why we compare these things and go back and discern it next to the word of God. It is all for the gospel, for the blood of Jesus Christ. We want to take whatever it is and we want to use it to point people to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the same way, when Paul went to Greece, the altar to the unknown God, he took something there within their culture and he used it to point to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, it's all for the Lord and Savior. All right, thank you.